Good morning. Thanks, uh, everybody, for coming uh, to my presentation this morning. It's, it's a good follow-on to Willie's presentation just before. We talked about the low-level hardware that we're using, uh, that we're hoping to use in our, in our in machines eventually. I'm going to talk today about an ongoing research project at uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, the machine. Uh, how many of you have heard of the machine? Awesome. I guess our marketing pitch is working. Um, I am going to describe the hardware. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the online literature you see about the machine describes it in very vague terms. And in order to talk about the software, I do need to describe the hardware that we're building. Um, I'm going to try to give you enough detail for you to actually go out and build your own. Uh, not quite, but you know, enough to actually understand what we are building. Um, and then I'm going to go into a lot more detail about the software. And the awesome part about the software is every time I get to present about the software, it's completely different because we've uh, we spent a bunch more time between the last time I presented about it building the software. So the last time I talked about this was in London in December. And so in the last two months, we've done a huge amount of work. And so I've got a lot more content. So the hardware part of my talk gets uh, shorter and shorter, and the software talk gets longer and longer. Um, I've been listening over the, over the uh, last four days uh, to uh, people asking me questions about the machine and other people doing work in similar areas, and so I've tried to add some content, uh, update my slides, in the, well, I added another slide during the last talk, um, <laughs> to try to give you a, a, a more, uh, more relevant information. So what is the machine? Uh, well, we started out by uh, noticing that there were a bunch of interesting hardware technologies coming online at a very, in a very similar uh, period of time. Um, SOCs are getting more plentiful and with many more threads in them, and uh, you can buy SOCs to do a lot of different things. And so, and by SOC, I mean just a computational unit, so anything that does computation but doesn't, do, doesn't have storage in it. Um, we're starting to be able to build a photonic interconnect right to the silicon, and by that I mean actually taking a piece of glass fiber and gluing it to the top of your CPU. Um, and the awesome part about that is you get rid of the, uh, the latencies of copper and the power consumption of copper. Uh, the uh, diameter of copper, because the signals trans, uh, are faster in glass than they are in copper. And so photonics gives you a huge number of advantages. And the other thing that's happening recently is a change in the way that we're storing data. Uh, we've had DRAMs for a long time. How many of you started out your uh, careers programming on machines without DRAM? Yeah, see? How many of you used uh, persistent memory, as we called it back in the day, core memory? Yeah, I, I used a machine with core memory. Uh, Willie was talking about total system persistence uh, in his talk and the dream of being able to turn a machine off and back on and have it keep going. I had that on my PDP-11. We did that in uh, 1979. So we're, getting, we're back to the future, as often is the case. Um, so we're talking about these three different technologies kind of converging together. And so at HP, uh, HP uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we're trying to merge, trying to kind of synthesize what a computer would look like if all, once all these technologies are available. So we have the electrons driving our uh, processing, and we have photons transmitting our data. And now we're talking about using, uh, using Memristor, which uses ions to store, uh, store information persistently. And we're moving from this processor-centric world where you have a network connecting all of your processors and each processor has a tiny little pool of data connected to it. And in order to do computation and large amounts of data, you spend an enormous amount of time transferring data around this, this crazy architecture. When the data is really the heart of your enterprise, excuse me, I'm channeling my corporate, uh, corporate namesake, I guess. Um, so the problem with this architecture is that if you have a problem which doesn't fit in any one of these individual processors' memory and where the, and where the data needs to be shared among all the computational elements, you're completely bound up by this, uh, by this communication overhead. And so if we take the memory out of the, out of the edge of the computer or bring it into the center of the computer and we talk about something of a memory-driven computing architecture where we have the memory as the center of the machine and the processors communicating with each other through that memory, all of a sudden the scale of the problem you can attack is dramatically increased. Um, so here we have uh, the classic computing model where you have applications and file systems and networking systems and this enormous operating system. I mean, I love Linux. It's a great system, but the, least, the, le the fewer CPU cycles I spend down there, the, fa the faster my application can run. So when we talk about a memory-driven computing architecture, we're talking about the application having access to all of the storage in the machine through a load store interface. I don't have to do I.O. operations at all. All of a sudden, this tradition that we've, uh, we've come, up, come up with in the database world where you have an application that opens up a file, that talks to a disk driver, that talks to a disk, and what does that application want to do? It wants to access that data with load store instructions, so it memory maps it. And so now we have this huge overhead of every time you want a memory map file, you have to talk about msync and all this 
huge I.O. latencies. What we really want to do is have the application talking directly to the storage and just getting rid of Linux, getting it out of the way. So you have an application talking directly to your fabric. That's what we really want to get to. So how are we building this? Well, we're not building it in that, it, we're not building a giant pool of memory that is separate from your processing. What we're building instead uh, today is we're building uh, the next generation memory interconnect, which is a memory fabric. And so what that means is that instead of uh, connecting our processors and network uh, and memory through uh, a PCI bus or through NICs or anything, anything like that, we're actually constructing uh, an interconnect that connects processors and memory at the memory level. So right at the, at the fastest bus on your processor, we're connecting all of the processors and memory together. So for our first instantiation of the machine, we're actually constructing these individual nodes that have a combination of computation and storage. And they're all connected together through the next generation memory interconnect, which is a switch-based fabric uh, that connects all of these devices together. And that means instead of communicating through a NIC from processor to processor or memory to memory, now I can communicate directly through the memory interface. Uh, so imagine getting rid of the PCI bus in your machine and having everything go through the fastest interconnect you have, that, that DRAM interface, except we're using uh, um, a wide variety of different memories. Each node on this, uh, on this architecture has these three different pieces. It has a, a compute complex on the node, and it has a memory complex on the node, and it has this switching fabric. The interesting thing about this is the compute complex is not, is not directly managing that memory at all. The storage complex on this, on this system is a part of the larger fabric because the compute complex talks through the fabric to even the memory local to its node, which means that when you have a large collection of nodes in the machine, uh, as shown in this picture, you'll see that the, the uh, SOCs have to communicate through the fabric to all of the, all of the memory. So when, the, uh, when a remote SOC wants to communicate with stuff, let me go forward a couple of slides here. Uh, when a remote, oh, come on. Thank you, OpenOffice, or LibreOffice, as this is, of course. So when a node on the machine wants to communicate with uh, uh, storage, on a, uh, when an SOC, a one node, wants to communicate with storage on another node, it goes through the fabric without ever talking to the SOC on that other node. So all of a sudden, your communication overhead is, is, the software part of your communication overhead is eliminated, and the SOCs get to communicate with all of the storage in the machine independent of the processing elements in those nodes. So one of the things we could do with this architecture is we can actually get rid of the SOC on any of those nodes and just put more storage there. Uh, we could get rid of the storage on those nodes and put more computation. We could, we could have a heterogeneous computation in this environment. We don't have to use all of the same processor. So when Willie was talking, uh, uh, talking at the end of his talk about, oh, well, we don't really have to worry about heterogeneous computing because who would, who would be crazy enough to put a big Indian CPU and a little, little Indian CPU connecting to the same NVDIMMs? Well, uh, we are those crazy people. We're planning on making a system where you can have any, on any computational unit you want connected to the memory of the system directly. And so your persistent memory becomes your communications and collaboration fabric. So we talk about a community of computing. Well, here's your community of computing. It's you all share the same memory. Everybody gets to work on the same data all at once. Uh, what is this going to look like at hardware? Here's the node that we're building for the first instantiation of the machine. Uh, the first instantiation of the machine has a little SOC. It's a 64-bit ARM processor. Uh, it has the FPGA we're using to implement the, the first version of our next generation memory interconnect. And that talks so that you can see those actually separate boards. There's a little gray space between, those, uh, between the compute complex on the right and the memory complex on the left. And so those actually communicate through the fabric, and there's a cable that goes between them to do that computation. OK, so what are the capabilities of this machine? OK, so the SOC has a little bit of local DRAM. And that SOC is actually going to run a version of Linux right in that DRAM. And we're going to treat that, uh, that uh, next generation memory inter interconnected fabric memory as a giant device. So how much memory do we have? Well, where the SOC has a small amount, only 256 gigabytes of local RAM, and then connected over the fabric, each node in the machine will have four terabytes of RAM. OK, so you have a four terabyte device and a 256 gigabyte uh, local DRAM. How many of these are we going to connect together? Because remember, I can interconnect as many as I want. Well, I can connect a lot of them. Here's an enclosure of systems that has, um, has eight, eight systems in an enclosure. So that's 32 terabytes of RAM. 
then I can stack those enclosures into a rack, 10, rack, uh, 10 enclosures high for a total of 80 processors and memory uh, connections. So the first, the first version of the machine I'm going to build has 320 terabytes of, of uh, storage, of memory accessible storage. So I'm going to be able to uh, support problems that today you, can, you can't even really contemplate putting in a single address space. Uh, what's, the, what's one of the fundamental problems of 320 terabytes? It's bigger than 256 terabytes, which is the largest processor I can buy except from IBM. So I have a, a, a fundamental problem there. Okay, so now I can build a rack of those. And of course, what I really want to do is I really want to build a data center full of these, all connected at the, at the address space level, thousands of machines to take over and, and, uh, and run all of your data. Uh, the address space that we're constructing is actually 75 bits. So we're actually constructing a 32 zettabyte address space. So in theory, I could connect an awful lot of these computers. As I said, the 320 byte uh, version is, is just the, the kind of the prototype that we're building that we can build today. Uh, we plan to build larger machines in the future. So when Willie was talking about six terabytes as being an interesting large amount of storage, um, yeah, that's kind of a good start. Um, although from HPE today, you can actually purchase a machine with 24 terabytes of RAM, and that's what we're doing a lot of the prototyping in. Um, I'm trying to remember what the corporate, the, uh, the commercial name of that thing is. Uh, <laughs> I've forgotten. Yeah, there's a, a machine that you could purchase from HPE today that has uh, 16 processors and 24 terabytes of RAM and a single system image, and we're doing a bunch of development on that uh, for the software on the machine, which has been very useful. So we have this fabric attached memory. There's uh, 320 terabytes of it. Um, the problem is, is that our processor can't access all of that at once. Another problem is, is that you have 80 different computers talking to the same storage. And so you want to be able to protect the memory from, one, from each of the processors. Uh, one of the fundamental principles of the machine architecture is that we provide security at a hardware level underneath the operating system. Uh, how many of you have had your Linux systems exploited and the, and the, and the operating system compromised? over the network? Yeah, all of us. Um, we are putting hardware protections underneath the operating system to protect the storage from your operating system. So when the operating system is compromised, it can only compromise the memory that it was granted access to and not the entire storage on the machine. So we're going to actually uh, construct a mapping between the physical addresses in the, in the, in the SOC and the, and the bus addresses on the fabric with a, a dynamic physical to fabric mapping. Now, why are we having to do that? <laughs> yeah, well, because I have a, as much, only, only as much as a 48-bit physical address coming out of the CPU, and I need more than 48 bits on the fabric to talk to my 320 terabytes of memory. So I'm actually having to put another memory management interface between the processor between the physical addresses of the processor and the memory it's sitting on. And that turns out to be really painful. Um, we're doing, uh, we're, we're, uh, the storage, um, I'm gonna show you some more slides here. Yeah, I'm gonna go over here and show you this slide. So here, here's kind of how memory is accessed in the machine. You have the SOC core, the ARM, 64-bit uh, ARM. It generates uh, virtual addresses, 48 bits. It generates physical addresses, somewhere between 44 and 48 bits. Um, and then that, uh, that goes out over the uh, cache coherence uh, interconnect out of the processor. And we uh, plug into that and we take the physical addresses coming out of that and map them into these uh, logical Z addresses that go out on the next generation memory interconnect. And so those are 53 bits that we get to pl play with. So the current, uh, the current architectures, the current FPGA stuff that we're doing is limited to a mere eight petabytes. Um, and that goes out over the firewall, which does our permissions checks, and then we translate the, uh, the 53 bit logical Z address and before we transmit it, we send it out as a 75-bit 75 uh, 75 Z address on the fabric. So the key here, the, uh, some of the interesting parts here is that the uh, PA to LZA transition, this, this mapping that we're doing, which uh, operates in either, which uh, does the translation, is separate from the notion of protection. And with this hardware protection, the firewall down there, and that firewall actually physically protects the memory from the SOC. And that's, uh, each of these firewalls has a table of permissions bits uh, for all of the memory within the fabric. Right now we support uh, eight, up to eight petabytes, and so uh, we don't want to use very fine granularity because every single firewall has to have uh, a linear table of these things. So we're actually using uh, the protection unit we're using, we're calling a book. It's a collection of pages. What do you call a collection of pages? You call it a book. And the books are small amounts of memory in our world, only eight gigabytes a piece. And so every firewall has a table of which eight gigabyte book 
uh, each SOC can access. And those are programmed outside of the realm of the operating system, and we'll show you how the software does that in a minute. So we actually pr physically c protect all of the memory in the machine from the SOC and the operating system itself with this firewall. Uh, one of the things that the machine is very focused on, this is the slide that I just added, uh, so it may seem a little out of sequence, um, is uh, one of the main focuses that we have here is for security in this environment. We don't trust anybody in our world. Um, I'm sure you don't trust anybody in your world either. So what we're currently doing is we're actually encrypting all of the data in the memory. So if you pull the memory out of the machine and, and steal it away to another machine and plug it back in, you, there's nothing you can do with it. The data is uh, encrypted in that, in that device. Uh, the keys are provisioned when the machine starts up, so when the machine is powered down or reset, uh, the memory is completely unavailable to everybody because it's encrypted. What we're hoping to do in the future is actually encrypt the data at the SOC level so that every piece of memory uh, that an SOC talks to has a key that's specific to that SOC or group of SOCs working with that memory. So if you want to uh, be able to forget what that memory contains, all you have to do is discard the key and that memory is no longer readable by anybody on the planet. And those keys, of course, would be provisioned at boot time and, and uh, updatable. The goal, of course, is to make it so that if that machine, if any piece of that machine is, uh, is being monitored by another agent, uh, e either within the machine or without the machine, that that uh, data that we're transmitting will be encrypted at all times. So we're trying to make it as secure as we know how. Okay, so I've told you about the machine hardware how the hardware works. You understand that's a giant network of, of, of computers that communicate through this fabric. We also do wire them up with Ethernet because we figure somebody's going to want to be able to get data in and out of this device, and we'll show you one really interesting use of that in a while. But I want to talk about uh, what we're doing for an operating system. Well, when we decided to do an operating system, uh, it was pretty easy to know that we were going to have to support at least one operating system, and that one operating system, of course, was Linux. Uh, there are other people thinking about doing other operating systems. A little company, Redmond, might do their operating system on our hardware. Uh, there's a, a bunch of crazy researchers doing, you know, next generation hardware. You know, Willie talked about replacing the memory as being a, a, a reason to do a new operating system. Well, we're replacing the memory and a bunch of other stuff. So we got a bunch of other crazy OS researchers off doing, off doing la la things. Uh, meanwhile, back in the real world, we're doing Linux on the machine. Um, all the operating system work that we're doing is going to be free software operating systems. We're not doing anything which is isn't free software, of course. Um, of course. So we're modifying Linux to support our crazy hardware. It's actually not a huge modification if you think about it. If you think about it in the right way, each of these nodes in the, in the machine has a processor, and it has a little bit of local DRAM, 256 gigabytes, it has a NIC, and it has this weird-ass device, this 320 terabytes of uh, available memory that it can map. So if you think about it, it's just a computer with a strange device attached. And you think, okay, I'm going to run Linux on the computer, and then I'm going to run a device driver for a crazy device. Not a really big deal. Uh, so from a kernel perspective, getting the kernel running in this thing isn't a huge amount of work. We have a little device driver that talks to the crazy device, uh, and we have um, uh, some user space stuff that knows how to talk with that. So the kernel changes necessary to run in this are fairly modest. However, we need to build a larger system that uh, actually uh, manages the entire enclosure of the system and manages uh, allocations of that underlying hardware. Uh, so we have to have uh, libraries that talk to that stuff. Uh, Willie talked about the libpmm stuff we're doing. We're porting libpmm and a whole bunch of other crazy libraries to support this stuff. Um, in order to allocate and share that, sh uh, that resource of 320 terabytes, we're creating a new file system. The file system is not a high-performance file system designed for rapid transactions. It's a file system that allocates, uh, allocates storage in eight gigabyte units. We expect that you're not going to do that very often. So it is the simplest possible file system we could construct that would barely work. And I'll show you how that works in a while. Uh, we have an interesting architecture for abstracting uh, data communication between the nodes in the machine. Uh, a lot of people are using Rocky or uh, RDMA for transmitting memory in a, in a, um, in a cluster environment. We're taking the, uh, the RDMA APIs that people have seen for, for applications like that, uh, providing an abstraction on, on top of it. And I'll talk a little more about that in a while. And of course, it's an 80 node, pro an 80 node uh, effectively looks like an 80 node cluster. And so we have a bunch of cluster management utilities uh, that get OSs uh, running on the various things and do data logging and all that kind of stuff. And I'll talk about that as well. 
so here is our current, in, uh, current version of the system software for the machine, what we've built today and what we're actually running uh, tests on internally. Uh, we have a, a management server uh, that does all of our shared management. Right now what that shared management does is it runs, that, it runs a daemon that supports this shared allocation. We call it the librarian because once you have books full of memory, of course you have to have a librarian that manages your books. Yeah, it, was, it was kind of fun when our, uh, when our recent college graduate uh, engineer came up with this whole library metaphor, and it was like, okay, I suppose we can use that. It'll be kind of fun. The nice thing is that the libra librarian as a term isn't used in Linux, but of course, we really don't want to talk about a library of books because library is kind of a heavily overloaded term in our world, so we avoid that. Uh, and in, in fact, a collection of books in our world is called a shelf. <laughs> so we don't call it a library, because otherwise it would be very confusing. Inside Linux user space on each node, we have a bunch of uh, different little uh, systems that we've added. We have some, a control interface for the librarian file system. We have a bunch of new libraries. We have PMEM, uh, that the PMEM.io uh, pro uh, project is working on, that Intel's running. Uh, we have a regular POSIX APIs. Uh, we have this RVMA stuff that we're building that we're going to talk about. And of course, we have an Atomics library. You're saying, uh, why do you need special support for Atomics? Well, the big problem that we have with an 80 node cluster of processors with 320 terabytes of RAM over many, uh, you know, the, our goal is to be able to build a data center full of this. It's not cache coherent. <laughs> Which, from a hardware perspective, is awesome. The hardware architects are like, woo woo, no cache coherence. How, how awesome is this? And our software guys are like, oh my god, we're going back to the 80s? This is really hard. Um, so we, we, the hardware actually does atomic support uh, in the fabric itself. So you can do atomic transactions in the fabric. To expose that up to user space today, we're providing a library. Of course, we'd really love for the processors to talk to this stuff directly. And maybe they will someday. So the big part that we're building right now is the, the is librarian. That's what we focused a bunch of time on. It's our allocation, our storage allocation system. It's a machine-wide, which is to say all 80 nodes in the current prototype um, uh, share the same allocator to, uh, to the global storage. Um, it's actually running on a separate machine. Um, now, when you're building a new computer, and if you have to have a system which is going to manage all of the nodes in the machine, the thing we decided that we didn't want to trust or count on was that each of those nodes would be reliable from power on. Uh, so we actually, cr we actually are just uh, taking an existing DL380 server, uh, the HPE builds, and sticking it in the same rack with all the rest of this stuff. And it's called our top of rack management server. Whether it actually fits in the same rack or not is unknown. Uh, but it's a separate machine that's sitting on the same network, but it doesn't have access to the fabric. So here we have a file system whose metadata is running in a separate machine on the network, and the data is stored in, in, in is only accessible to the things, which is not the, it's kind of a weird file system. Um, the communication between the nodes, which are within the machine, and the top of rack management server for the library and file system is all over TLS. Of course, everything is secure. Um, there are only metadata operations, of course. The top of rack management server not being a participant in the machine has no access to the fabric, which means that I can't store the metadata in the fabric itself. And in fact, I'm storing the metadata for the file system in a SQL database. <laughs> yeah, talk about high-speed file systems. Well, those are other things. That, that is not this thing. Um, the other thing that the, the top of rack management server is doing with this, of course, is it has to manage all those firewalls. Remember those permission blocks that uh, control access for the nodes to the, uh, to the fabric? Yeah, the librarian is actually responsible for programming those. The way that happens, a little widgy. I think I actually have a slide on that. Let's see if I, where am I in my presentation here? I can't even tell. So the goal here is to, is to uh, provide a kind of a two-level allocation scheme where the librarian is responsible for man managing memory in larger units, the eight gigabyte books, and then we uh, provide uh, systems underneath that that manage allocation at a finer granularity. For instance, one thing you could obviously do is take one of these librarian, uh, one of these librarian collections of books that we call shelves and create an uh, ext4 file system on that. Fairly straightforward plan. Um, and then the ext4 file system would run within a particular node and talk to those books. Obviously, another thing you'd really like to be able to do is a high-performance, fine granularity, distributed file system that ran across all the nodes in the machine. Anybody got one of those that runs on a shared memory environment across 80 nodes? 
Nobody here, huh? Uh, by the way, if you know how to build such a thing and are interested in a job, yeah, come talk to me. I want that, <laughs> and I can't have that today. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to build that. We're also building a bunch of other what we call retail memory brokers or retail allocators. Um, a lot of them are like the things you saw in the LibPMM talk earlier where you have an object store. So we're hoping there's going to be a whole interesting uh, line of research in how you do allocation uh, across operating system instances using shared memory, uh, shared persistent memory, of course. So we're hoping to, be, hoping, to, hoping to spark a bunch of research in that area. Okay, uh, so here's how the uh, fabric attached memory is actually managed within the machine. You have this top of rack management server that has a librarian, um, has, has some other services up there that manage, manage things like user IDs and passwords and that kind of stuff. And then within Linux user space in every node, you have this weird collection of little processes. These are all actually written in Python. Uh, we have the, um, the library and file system proxy, um, and we have the firewall proxy. And you're thinking, wait a minute, the operating system isn't supposed to be in charge of its own firewall because we're supposed to be protecting the memory from the operating system. So what's the operating system doing in the middle of the communication between the library and the firewall? Well, it turns out that the way our hardware is built, uh, we're going to stick the firewall controller down in the ARM trust zone. And the problem with that is the trust zone has no way of talking over the network yet because we don't have, yeah, it's all very convoluted. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to pipe all the firewall communications through the firewall proxy, but they're all going to be encrypted, so the firewall proxy has no idea what they are. Um, and so the, the OS is going to be transmitting the data but not interpreting the data. And we have some glorious plans about how if the OS fails to actually send the firewall commands, we're eventually going to kill it. Uh, we, have a, we have a power switch where the top of rack management server can turn the power off on the node. So if the node fails to cooperate, we'll just shoot it in the head. Um, the librarian file system, we want to do secure communications with the uh, top of rack management server. That's really hard to do from the kernel. Uh, TLS is not, uh, not currently available in the kernel. So what we're doing is we're, we're actually implementing the librarian file system by, uh, by forking Fuse. So we have this weird Fuse module in the kernel that does our librarian file system, and it forwards all the, all the metadata operations up to user space uh, to this, uh, to this uh, librarian file system proxy, which then enwrap, wraps them all in TLS bits and ships them over the network. So it's kind of a widgy system, but it turns out to be kind of a convenient development environment because most of the, the file system work we, we're doing, we're actually writing in Python and user space on both sides of the link, which is kind of a, a convenient development environment. And then, of course, within the kernel, we have all these other pieces that, that, that it's communicating. We have the file system itself, which is this fuse clone, uh, this fuse fork. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to build a local file system, you're going to uh, create the, use a loop, loop block device driver to stick a, a loop block, a, a block device on top of one of these librarian file system objects. So the librarian file system talks about shelves, and of course, when you map that into POSIX space, a shelf turns into a file. So all of a sudden, you have this global resource which can now be treated in the POSIX space as a convenient file. Uh, so with that POSIX API, you can open the shelves or files. Uh, you can set their size with ftruncate or POSIX fallocate. Uh, you can map them into your own memory. Um, and because we've written all of our own device stuff in the kernel, uh, mmap works awesome. So unlike the, uh, the, talk that, the stuff Willie was talking about where you had to hack the file systems to support direct mapping, well, that's all our file system wants to do. So our file system directly supports mmap. So we don't need any of the stuff that... Uh, that the Linux kernel community is working, worrying about DAX at all. It just works natively with our file system. Of course, the allocation unit you get with our file system is kind of big. Uh, even with 320 terabytes of memory, there's only 40,000 books available. So you can only have 40,000 files in our file system. That makes for a lot of simplifying assumptions in our file system design. There's no sparseness. Uh, all the uh, POSIX uh, locking APIs, yeah, that's node local. So if you have multiple nodes trying to do file locking, <laughs> sorry, we didn't do that. So we, we cut out a, of this, a bunch of the semantics because we're building a research vehicle here. We're not building a product. It's very convenient, right? It's like, oh, yeah, our researchers promise to never need that. Awesome. We won't do that. <laughs> yeah, th there may be some additional semantics required when we take this thing into production. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? 
Uh, here's a diagram that you can't read, but uh, the slides will be available online. You can see it later. You can see the interactions between the kind of path of interactions that we did when we designed the librarian file system between the application and the kernel and the librarian and the aperture and the firewall. And there's a bunch of interactions going on. We did like probably half a dozen of these diagrams to make sure we could actually implement things. And it shows the data flows between the various things. Um, this was way more visible in a presentation I did earlier. Uh, with, a, with a better projector, and I apologize for this uh, projector's uh, shortcomings. But that's kind of the development methodology we use. We, we put together a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, short vignettes of how the file system might be used and went through the process of developing the data flows to make sure it would actually work. So within that, so now that we've constructed this file system that, that goes across the, all of the nodes, and we have these other libraries who are merging in, what does an application see? in the machine. How, how does an application work? Well, we have a bunch of different libraries. We have the, the PMEM stuff that Intel's working on. We have an Atomics library that I'm going to talk about in a minute. We have the regular POSIX API. So a POSIX application can open a, open a file in, this, in the library and file system, mmap it, mutate bytes, um, and it's all, and it's all uh, stored globally, globally visible across the entire fabric. We have this new da data sharing library called RVMA. And of course, they have a, a new little library for doing uh, manipulations that are weird on the, li on the library and file system. It's a persistent shared file system. It's not quite a POSIX file system. So there's a couple operations we need to expose to applications. And um, we're doing that with a new library, because that's how we do things. Um, of course, we have the physical address mapping problem. Our, our tiny address space in the SOC is only 48 bits of virtual address space. Um, and only 40, and only as much as 48 bits of uh, physical address space. Um, the SOC caches are physically tagged. And the problem with that is that our address space is larger than the physical address space of the machine, which means that whenever I want to change and talk, change the physical address space to talk to a new thing with that LZ, with that uh, physical address to LZA. LZ address uh, mapper, every time I want to change that, I have to tell the processor, oh, by the way, your physical address space has changed. What does that mean from the processor's perspective? Well, the processor has no idea how to deal with this. You go up to a processor vendor and say, hey, I want to be able to change the physical addresses underneath the processor. The processor vendor is like, uh, you're going to have to flush the cache. So you ask the processor vendor, OK, so how do I flush the cache? And on the ARM64 architecture, it turns out the way that you flush the cache is you flush the cache in every single core in the processor. And when your processor has dozens of cores, that takes a while. Then you ask the processor vendor, OK, so what can I do this in parallel? And the processor vendor says, no, I'm sorry, you can't do this in parallel because the ARM architecture allows the cores to share, to transmit cache lines between the cores laterally um, and, and not flush them in the meantime. It's a performance improvement, right? That's what processor, processor architects are all about. So as one, process, as one core flushes its cache, it may, uh, a cache line from another processor may get migrated over after it's passed over that address, that part of the cache. And then this processor, this core will flush its cache, and this cache line won't be there anymore because it got migrated over. So this cache line will never get flushed. So I actually get to bring the entire processor to a halt and carefully serialize the flushing of every single core. Uh, so we're desperate to avoid that. <laughs> yeah, it takes a long time. Um, uh, eventually, eventually, somebody's going to build us a processor with enough physical bits we'll be able to get rid of this. So for the initial prototype, it, uh, there's kind of going to be this wall, right? Performance is going to be amazing until you run out of physical address space. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be a cliff. So it's like running out of physical memory, except now we're running out of physical address space. So it may be, it may be, that, the, it may be that some applications aren't going to run as fast on this hardware as we'd like. But you, know, you, uh, you, you, uh, you, build what, uh, you build the system you can. And it's in a, it, I think it's going to still be an interesting, interesting result. We're pretty close to the amount of physical space that we need. 48 bits is not a long ways from, from 320 terabytes. Uh, okay, so why do we need atomics? Well, I, I told you that the caches are not coherent between the nodes on this machine. Within a single processor, of course, all the memory within that and its visibility into our shared memory, that's all coherent. But outside of that, there is no coherence. And so we actually put into the fabric itself uh, atomic operations. There's an atomic swap, an atomic add, an atomic test and set. Fairly straightforward atomic operations. Those are in the memory fabric itself. 
So those have to be exposed up to user space with a library through a device driver, which is kind of painful. Uh, so we built a little library that exposes all this stuff. Uh, we added some more operations, and the awesome part about uh, doing an FPGA for your memory controller is that, oh, you know, I'd really like to have this other operation in there, and the FPGA can just get reprogrammed. So we may change what uh, stuff are done in hardware and what stuff is done in software over time. So this makes it look like you have atomic operations uh, at the CPU level, but unfortunately we can't use the CPU instructions, so we have a library. Uh, yeah, I talked about that. And here's kind of what the library looks like. You, know, you, you, you register a pile of memory and say, I want to be able to do atomics in this space. And then the library does the appropriate syscalls in order to talk to the device underneath. Uh, so we also need to do cache management because we're not cache coherent. And because we have, uh, we'd, like to get, uh, we'd like to be able to um, flush things out of the local SOC and into the shared, onto the fabric so that we can share data with other SOCs, non-cache coherent. So we're using, uh, we're using Intel's libpmem. Uh, Intel's libpmem has the notion of persisting memory, which is to say getting it out of the processor and into the fabric, but it doesn't have the notion of invalidating your memory, which is to say, oh, whatever you've got in your local caches is not valid anymore. So we've added some simple extensions to the pmem library uh, to say whether that address space needs to be invalidated if you're communicating with another SOC. Uh, so we have this invalidate addition to the library, and I'm sure Intel will love to take that into their library sometime. Um, the other thing, of course, we've done with libpmm is ported the ARM64, which is kind of an adventure. Um, and the other problem that we have is we have a lot of memory. Uh, 320 terabytes of uh, memory in a system, it turns out that you're going to get errors in that. Who would have thought? Uh, uh, the memory controller that we're, we're putting into these things has an amazing amount of ECC, but even still we expect to get memory errors on occasion. Uh, read errors are fairly easy to manage from an application perspective. You try to read from memory, it says, I'm sorry, I didn't remember what you told me to remember, and you get a synchronous error back from the memory controller. And so you can just kill the, pro kill the process with a SIG bus or whatever you want to do. That's pretty easy to manage. Write errors are harder. Remember, the caches store the memory for days. And so you have no idea when your memory is going to actually get, uh, try to actually get out to the, the, the fabric and uh, hit the memory that's broken. But applications need to know about the failure. So what we're doing is we're using the libpmem uh, PMM drain as a barrier. That's the function that Intel uh, puts uh, their x86 p commit instruction into. So we're going to add a bit more logic in our architecture so that when you call that, we're actually going to uh, capture all the errors, all the right errors that may have happened in memory and send your application a SIG bus. Now, one of the interest, one of the useful architectures, the distinctions in the machine is it has this 256 gigabytes of local memory to run the operating system out of, and then the 320 terabytes of shared memory is something that only applications use. We're not putting any kernel data structures there. So when you get a memory error on the fabric, we don't have to worry about the kernel being corrupted. All we have to do is worry about user space being corrupted. So we can actually kill individual applications and processes instead of having to kill the entire machine. So the goal is to be able to have a smaller unit of um, kind of a field replaceable piece of software so that when, that's, when the memory error occurs, that software can be restarted and not have to restart the entire machine. And that's the goal of these changes. Uh, the other thing, of course, is because we have a fabric, we have different uh, locations. That there's memory located all over the fabric. And so you want to be able to say, well, I want to have some of my memory stored at the bottom of the rack and other stuff stored at the top of the rack. So if this part of the rack dies, I'll be able to recover my uh, duplicate data from the top of the rack. So you want to be able to tell the system where to allocate it. So we have an allocation, a way of telling the system where to put the, each allocation using some extended attributes in the, in the librarian file system. It's a pretty straightforward plan. Uh, here's our remote virtual uh, memory access library I talked about. Uh, so you ha we have all these APIs that do data sharing across a network. Uh, those, that data sharing across a network is horribly inefficient when you have something as fast as the machine. So we're constructing an API underneath all of those called RVMA that lets you use the network for, for prototyping your application in a regular cluster. But then when you move it over to the machine, we're going to take advantage of the, of the higher performance memory interconnect to move that memory much more efficiently. So we're providing that abstraction that lets you do development with your existing, uh, eco, uh, your existing hardware environment and then get better performance when you move it into the machine. Uh, here's our, our next generation uh, software architecture uh, for the system software for the machine. We're adding a bunch more stuff. Uh, this is the stuff I just finished uh, last Friday specifying, and we're busy working on actually implementing bits of this now. Um, yeah. 
So one of the things we discovered that is we, when you, uh, the machine that we're building right now doesn't have persistent memory because I can't afford that much NVDIM. Uh, so we're just going to put DRAM in it. Uh, it turns out that 320 terabytes of DRAM, um, you can put it in a relatively small space, but it turns out that when you turn the power off, it, it forgets. Um, thanks. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to be able to turn the power off so we can like move the machine or, or change its power configuration. So we need to be able to take all that data in the machine and store it somewhere. Well, it turns out that 320 terabytes of data takes a long time to pump over a single network connection. So we actually spent a bunch of time and developed a kind of complicated and crazy architecture for backing up all this data. Did I actually put the picture of the hardware in here? I think I do. I can put these in the wrong order. Sorry about that. So here's the hardware that we've built. We have these external storage servers, and we have this massively high-performance network switch. Uh, and then we have the instance of the nodes of the machine. So each of the nodes has a network connection to the switch, and then each of the switch has connections to each of the storage servers. And so the, the plan is to take each of those SOCs and pump their data over the, over the network to these storage servers. It turns out to be a huge amount of work. So here I have a picture of the architecture for that. We have the librarian telling everybody where all the memory is located and the, each of the node of the machine busily taking its little slice of the data and pumping it over the, over the network to the storage cluster. So we don't know if this architecture is going to be useful going forward. We know we need it today. Uh, but it's kind of interesting. We're building a bunch of infrastructure just to, just to satisfy the requirement that we have the DRAM in the machine today. Um, and it may be useful later for data ingest and egest, and who knows? So that's a bunch of stuff that we've added. Uh, we also have a, I wanted to talk about one final thing. OK, so the machine doesn't exist today. Uh, we don't have any hardware that does this. Uh, but we'd really like to be able to do all of our software development. So we're, we built uh, a couple of different simulation environments, one of which is free software, and one of which is kind of an internal architectural simulator for low-level hardware stuff. I wanted to kind of give you a preview of what this is. So we're doing this uh, emulation. We call it the Fabric Attached Memory Emulator. And it provides a, a synthetic view, a synthetic machine uh, for doing current development. And then we have a simulator which does register level stuff. And then, of course, uh, we'll have the actual machine. So the goal is to be able to take your software and develop it on the emulator and then run it on the machine eventually. Because uh, we want to be able to do uh, hardware and uh, hardware software code development. So while we're de developing the hardware, we're getting the software ready. So here's the Fabric Attached Memory Emulator. Um, and the Fabric Attached Memory Emulator runs on a regular computer. So you can run this on a, what is this Dragon Hawk called? Superdome X, thank you. Man, brain is not working today. So we have this piece of hardware that has 16 processors and 24 terabytes of memory, which is kind of a pretty good simulation of the machine. It's single system image, and it has cache coherence across all of this. But at least it's a reasonable amount of memory and a reasonable number of processors. So what I do to simulate the machine is I take each one of those cores and a little piece of memory, and I create a little pretend computing node out of it. Uh, using virtualization. I stack up a bunch of these virtual nodes, and then I allocate a big pile of uh, memory out of the, out of the uh, underlying uh, hypervisor, the, the Linux kernel running KVM, and I just share it among all those nodes. And so now those nodes have shared access to this big pool of memory. Looks a lot like the machine, except it's virtualized. And so now I can run all of my simulation uh, stuff in that and provide a kind of a synthetic environment for the machine. So that's how we're doing our development. The Fabric Attached Memory Emulator is actually um, the, a little piece of it uh, that shows how this gets set up is available on GitHub right now. And there's a, a QR code with the link. I think the actual link is uh, visible in this, but just barely. That's kind of a picture of how it works. So we have a bunch of QEMU instances running, uh, running our version of Linux for the machine. Um, and then they have this shared memory backed by the host file system. So you actually get persistence, which is kind of cool. Um, and so all those instances, the, uh, all those instances of Linux are actually able to share that and make it look like our underlying memory fabric. Um, we're actually doing a bunch of interesting research on this hardware and discovering that there are a bunch of algorithms we're able to run on this hardware faster than a cluster. So we're actually taking a bunch of the technologies that we're doing for the machine and productizing them on the Superdome X hardware directly, which is pretty cool. Kind of early access to some of the research. Here's where we're working on free software, the persistent memory library stuff, direct access stuff, concurrent distributed file systems. We'd love to have those. 
Uh, trying to figure out how to get non-cache coherent uh, systems working again. Well, that's a challenge. We haven't done that for a long time. Another big piece of the puzzle, of course, is this uh, RAS and large memory systems. You've got a huge amount of memory. All of the RAS work we've done for persistence in the past has all been uh, based, on, based on block storage. Well, now I have byte storage, and RAS in a byte storage environment is very different from RAS in a block storage environment. So we're working on that as well. Hey, guys, I know I'm running out of time, and I want to thank you all for participating this morning and coming to LCA. Uh, as always, I love coming down to the Southern Hemisphere in the dead of winter. And uh, even though the weather doesn't seem awesome to you, let me tell you, it seems awesome to us. And thank you very much for your time and attention this morning.